So we've introduced three-phase flow, we've introduced the concept of spreading. Now let's look at this a little bit more rigorously in the presence of a solid surface, so we can look at flow in porous media. So you might recall the Young equation. So we're actually going to have three Young equations. Okay, so I'm going to draw, this is a solid, and I'm going to have two phases of the contact, so this is, in all cases, this will be a solid surface. And the answer, well, uh, why are there three Young equations? Well, let's, let's go through this carefully. So let's imagine we've got phase one here, and we've got phase two here. Then I'm going to define a contact angle, theta one, two, which is going to be the contact angle measured through phase one, the denser phase, in the presence of phase two. Okay, And just as we did with the Young equation, with just two phases, we're going to do a horizontal force balance. And I will illustrate why we're going to do this three times in a little bit. So let's write down the uh, Young equation for this case. So what we have is the horizontal force balance is that sigma 2s is equal to sigma 1s. Now tr I'm not going to try and do the colours. Plus sigma 1, 2 cos theta 1, 2. Okay? But that's not the only possibility. We can have phase 1 in contact with phase 3. So this will be theta 1, 3, the contact angle between phase 1 and phase 3. And here we can have it between phase 2 and phase 3, and this will be sigma 2, 3. And notice here in each case I am defining the contact angle as being measured through the denser phase when I have a pair. So let's write down um, the Young equation here. So this is sigma 3s is sigma 1s plus sigma 1, 3 cos theta 1, 3. And then this one is sigma 3s is equal to sigma 2s plus sigma 2, 3 cos theta 2, 3. Okay. Now, these are the three Young equations. We got three phases. But now when we come to discuss flow in porous media, we've already shown that wettability is really important. And the principal wettability we've been considering is a contact angle between two phases. So basically theta 1, 2, to be simple. We've already seen that that gives you quite a rich behaviour between um, wetting, non-wetting, mixed wettability. Along with three-phase flows, we've introduced three contact angles. And this is looking, you know, immediately seems to be spiralling a bit out of control. But actually, it's not too bad. The first thing we know, if this is oil and this is gas, we know, because oil tends to spread, that in most circumstances, this contact angle typically is uh, certainly less than 90 degrees and close to zero. So this idea of oil spreading, always want to be coating the gaseous phase, this contact angle um, is, is, as I said, often small. So this seems to be, we, we got one other contact angle. So in this case, it's the contact angle um, between water and gas. But what I'm going to show is that it's not independent. This is related to these two angles. You can't just have any wettability between water and gas and an independent wettability between oil and, um, sorry, between uh, water and oil. So you've got water and oil, we've got water and gas. Those two wettabilities are not independent. And that makes sort of physical sense, frankly. But let's do it mathematically. Um, what you see here is we've got these two um, equations and they've got the, the, the same um, sigma 3s. So we can get rid of sigma 3s. We can just make this one equal to this one, can't we? All right. So we can get rid of the sigma 3s here and we can say this is equal to this. Okay. So let's do, do this maybe a little bit clearer. Sigma 2s 
plus sigma 2, 3 equals theta 2, 3, and then do the equal sign in the right direction. Okay, um, is equal to what I got up at the top. Okay, so that's eliminated one of the surface, solid surface tensions, because these are actually quite difficult to measure and sort of messing up the analysis. Okay, so now what we've got here is, um, well, there's a sigma 2s and a sigma 1s, sigma 2s, sigma 1s. So why don't I take, I've got this, why don't I take away this? So this is sigma 2s minus sigma 2s here, okay? And this is going to be sigma 1s, right? Minus. So I can write all minus signs and then add them. Maybe that's the, the most transparent way. So this cancels out. I've just got this. So I've got sigma 2, 3, cos theta 2, 3. I've got the 1s. That just disappears. I've got this. Got, sorry, the equal sign. And I've got this minus this. So it's minus sigma 1, 2 cos theta 1, 2 plus sigma 1, 3 cos theta 1, 3. And I end up with the equation, which I'm going to write at the bottom here. Actually, maybe not at the bottom. Let's let's write it at the top because um, it's the key, key equation for today. Sigma 1, 3 cos theta 1, 3 equals sigma 1, 2 cos theta 1, 2 plus sigma 2, 3 cos theta so that's a rather interesting relationship, which actually relates the interfacial tensions, which are quantities that can be measured, and the contact angles. And so just to repeat, in most cases, okay, this contact angle is close to zero. The interfacial tension between gas and oil is quite low as well. So this term, this is approximately one, but this magnitude here is low. If we're looking in the deep subsurface with say carbon dioxide and oil, this interfacial tension becomes really very small. And then you can see that there is now a relationship between the wettability between oil and water and the wettability between gas and water. So this relationship was actually first derived in the 1930s. It's called the Bartel-Osterhoff relation. Okay. So now let's look at a couple of consequences of this. And, and I hope you can follow the mathematics. It's, it's reasonably straightforward. So don't get, you know, don't get yourself into a muddle um, over this. Um, it is... It is a perfectly rigorous uh, derivation, um, ass assuming that everything is in equilibrium. So let's take the first case, which would be something that's strongly hydrophilic, the water wet. And what I'm going to say is imagine I have a material, right, say a rock or fibres, that in the presence of oil, water is the wetting phase. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a water wet material in the presence of oil. So what this means, okay, if we're looking at here, that's oil water. So we're saying that theta one, two is approximately zero low contact angles. So the cosine is this. And we're also, we're going to assume that we have a spreading oil. So sp the co spreading coefficient is approximately zero. So sigma one three is sigma one two plus sigma two three. That's from the previous video. Well, in that case, let's just go through the equations. We get sigma one three cos theta one three is equal to sigma one two. And then I've already said that this cosine is close to zero plus sigma two three, and that's sigma one three. So cos theta one three is roughly one, theta one three is close to z. Well, that's not very interesting, is it? So what it's saying is, if I've got something, a material, that's very strongly wetting in the presence of oil, it's also very strongly wetting in the presence of gas. What is? 
Well, it's water wet. We haven't really talked about this. Something that likes water. It likes water. You put gas in, it, the surface likes water. You put oil in, the surface likes water. So that's obvious, right? And that's really what we mean by a hydrophilic surface. There's no surprise here. A hydrophilic surface likes, loves water, and it likes water in the presence of an oil or a gas. That's not what's interesting. What's interesting is the other case. And I'm going to just make a little bit of room here on the board. It's not going to take too much time to write this off up. Just want a little bit of space here for one equation. And we'll do a hydrophobic case. Okay. So what does it look like if we're strongly hydrophobic? So imagine we're hydrophobic in the presence of oil. So what we're saying is we've got a surface and imagine crude oil, right, organic material has adhered to that surface. So in the presence of oil, we're actually strongly oil wet. It can like oil. You now have a surface that likes oil that's made out of oil-like materials. So the other things to think about are plastic, or waxes or something like that. That is oil wet. So then cos theta, theta 1, 2 is roughly 180 degrees. It's the opposite. So cos theta is approximately minus one, okay? Minus one. We'll still retain that we got a spreading oil, okay? So we'll say that the spreading coefficient of roughly zero, and we'll assume that this, this cosine is plus one still, right? As I said, the oil, the oil is wetting, um, uh, sorry, the oil is wetting the presence of gas, and of course it's wetting in the presence of water now. So oil is definitely the wetting phase. So what do we see here? We see sigma 1, 3 cos theta 1, 3 is equal to minus sigma 1, 2 plus sigma 2, 3. So then the cosine and this is all divided by now let's have a look at that. This is the interfacial tension between oil and gas. And that's about 20 millinewtons per meter at ambient conditions. This between, um, sorry, this is not one three, it's one two, sorry. This is the interfacial tension between water and oil, and that's about 50 millinewtons per meter. If we go down to reservoir conditions, this interfacial tension gets lower and lower. Basically, if you certainly have got uh, supercritical CO2, it's liquid-like, it's actually a good solvent in the oil. The oil and the CO2, I won't say, um, I really have similar properties, but the interfacial tension is very low, about one millinewton per metre. And in fact, you can drive it down in propitious circumstances almost to zero. So this is negative. In almost all cases, this is negative. So this cos theta is negative. So a little bit of trigonometry, that's theta one three is greater than 90 degrees, okay? So that means that water is non-wetting to gas. So instead of this picture here, we have this picture. Gas is actually the wetting phase in the presence of water. Now, actually, I've written a lot of equations on this board, and it's looking a bit busy to say something that's pretty obvious. You're working at a table. Okay, the table's made out of wood. Wood naturally is water wet. That's how it soaks up water and nutrients. Okay, how, how trees and plants transpire. But your wood, your table, is probably not bare wood, is it? Because if it's bare wood, the problem is, I spill some coffee, or some red wine or something awkward like that, and it soaks into the table and you stain it. So, of course, what do you do? You put a varnish. And what's that varnish or a wax? Well, the wax is an oily substance. Varnishes, they're all petroleum products. Okay, they're oil-like. They're oil-wet. They repel water. So water forms, if you have a surface, okay, in the presence of my phase three, my gas, Okay, the water forms a droplet. It doesn't soak into the surface. Okay, and the reason is it forms a droplet and you can get rid of it really nicely. 
Okay, so we're used to this. If you go out in the rain, what are you going to wear to repel the water? A, pl a you know, plastic jacket. What's plastic made out of? Oil. Okay, so you have an oily surface repels water. So we know this in day-to-day -day life. The classic is, you know, why ducks don't get wet, right? Ducks spend all their time in water. Um, if they had feathers that were water wet, what would happen is their feathers would get soaked with water and they die of hypothermia. The feathers, however, are fluffy. They're a porous medium, a sort of fibrous porous medium. But ducks have a gland that they which produces oil and they keep that's one of the reasons why they're always doing this with their with their beak is they're getting this oil and they're fluffing their feathers up and they're maintaining their feathers as being oil wet and that means it repels water for water to move into the pore space we know all this we can you, you know don't don't get yourself into a muddle yeah it's a capillary pressure and it's a it's a capillary pressure where the pressure in phase one has to be higher than in phase three so you have to push the water in so it repels water um, and the Ducks stay dry. So this is, as I said, well known to everyone. Indeed, there's a children's book, Why Ducks Don't Get Wet, that basically has that explanation. There's only one field, rather unfortunately, where people are still, are you sure to rule? And yeah, unfortunately, this is the people who are dealing with subsurface engineering, in particular petroleum engineering. And petroleum engineering, the assertion is that gas is always the non-wetting phase. Well, it is non-wetting in the presence of oil, but in the presence of water, not necessarily. And that has some interesting consequences. In fact, it's water that is the most non-wetting phase. Oil often is the most wetting phase, and it's the gas, the CO2, that's intermediate wet. So the gas actually is intermediate wet. It can be confined to layers. Um, its flow potential is quite restricted. And that has enormous consequences for the design of CO2 storage if we're doing it in depleted hydrocarbon fields. So what this means is, and we'll just finish now with a recap with these three phases, is normally in terms of wettability, if we have a water wet medium, water is the most wetting. What comes next, it's oil. And what comes at the end, is gas. We have that order. But if we have an oil wet system, well, then it's obvious. Oil is most non wetting But now water can be here. Gas is intermediate. This um, gas is intermediate wet. So the gas is wetting in the presence of phase one. You can actually, if you look at these equations, you can play around with them. And if if this cosine isn't exactly minus one, so this isn't, this is some coefficient here, you can actually have something where you have oil as the most wetting phase, then water, and then gas. So you can have these three wetting orders. You can't have something that's truly gas wet. That doesn't make a, a lot of physical sense. But these is what you can see in both manufactured and artificial systems, um, these three types of wetting order. And we've certainly discussed these first two. And as I said, enormously consequential in terms of the design of flow processes where you have three fluid phases. Something that's still very much a research area, so I haven't got anything definitive to say. So I'll just leave it here. But certainly you should understand the bartol osterhoff equations, and you certainly should understand, first of all, why ducks don't get wet, but also what that means in terms of flow deep underground. Thank you very much.